Hello one and all, welcome to Seeing Through Glass. Welcome to the start of another mad adventure. Uh, back in the summer when I was attending Monterey Car Week, I met the awesome team from Carlosophy, who specialise in all things Lamborghini, but I think specifically cool, modern, classic Lamborghinis. Uh, we chatted, we bonded, we made a plan that at some point I'd go visit them in Frankfurt and make some videos. But a few weeks later, I got a call from Alex at Carlosophy saying, Sam, we've got a car that's going to be attending a load of UK car shows in September that we then need to get back to Frankfurt. Have you got any good car transportation businesses that you can recommend? I mean, of course I do, but I said, would you consider letting someone drive the car back to Germany? And this is where it turns out the team at Carlosophy are my kind of people, because they said, hells yeah, the car's made to be driven. Who are you thinking of? Well, me, <laughs> and that's exactly what's happening. Tomorrow, I'm gonna to be getting up very early and driving this 1996 Lamborghini Diablo SVR 500 miles to Frankfurt, Germany. The Diablo SBR was launched back in 1996 as a way for Lamborghini's best and maybe craziest customers to go racing. Uh, Lambo took the road-going SV, which had launched the year before, reduced weight by, I think, nearly 200 kilos, boosted power ever so slightly, installed a roll cage, added a huge spoiler, removed the rear bumper, removed the headlights, the windows got changed for plexiglass ones. I mean, everything you don't need for a racetrack was taken out. They added racing brakes, up to the suspension, a whole load of things to make Lambo's flagship V12 of the time handle some serious track time. Only 32 SVRs were made and they raced between I think 1996 and 2001 or 2002 before it was then replaced by the GTR which is actually what you're seeing footage of right now. That's because when the SVR came out it didn't qualify for any racing series at the time so Lamborghini created the Super Trofeo series, a one make racing series where owners compete against each other. Obviously Super Trofeo still exists today and it's given us road cars such as the Gallardo Super Trofeo Stradale and the Huracan STO but back then it was really just a way for 32 mad and rich Lambo owners to play racing driver. And so little footage and photos exist of that early racing. It wasn't until the GTR came around that the Super Trofeo series started to get a bit more attention. Now, the car I'm going to be driving was made road legal at some point in its life, but when Alex and Moritz got hold of it, they slowly started putting various R elements back onto this SVR road. But anyway, so it's somewhat a hybrid, but no less insane. The roll cage and bucket seats have been removed so that it's easier to use. The car has standard SV seats now. It's got climate control, a radio and headlights. But aside from that, it is truly still a race car on the road. Well, here we go. I'm underway, you find me on the Euro Tunnel. I set off at about 4.30 this morning, drove like an hour and a half in the dark in the rain, down to Folkestone, got on the train, and I'm somewhere under the channel right now. Uh, I thought I'd share some initial impressions from behind the wheel of the Diablo SVR. Uh, driving it this morning in the dark and in the rain, a little intense <laughs> on the headlights of this car. Don't do that much. It's as if two Italian men were sitting on the bonnet, sort of lighting matches. You're like, can you see? No, <laughs> no, I can't. On top of that, these very cool Lexan windows have these vents which are kind of perfectly positioned to block the wing mirrors, so you can't really see out of them. And on top of that, the rear view mirror doesn't do much either, so I had no clue what was going on behind me, changing lanes on the motorway with all the spray, yeah, yeah, heart in your mouth kind of stuff. I also can't really see the speedo. <laughs> um, from 80 to 280 kilometers an hour, I have no idea how fast I'm going. I don't know if it's because of my height, or the fact it's kind of angled down, it's just awkward and Italian. Uh, I can luckily though see all the temperature gauges and the fuel gauge. That's important because it seems to go down very quickly. I left the house with a full tank, probably did 100 miles, got half a tank left, so it's gonna be an expensive trip. And then finally, the windscreen seems to fog up quite regularly. I've been playing around with opening and closing these vents, also using the climate control, which does seem to work, that's a Brucey bonus. But yeah, just mm, not ideal. Aside from all that though, I am having the time of my life. I have never felt so cool arriving at the Eurotunnel. This thing is a toy. I mean, it literally has driven off the poster on your bedroom wall. It feels so special. Everyone's giving it a thumbs up. Everyone's coming over and asking about it. And look, it's actually way less intense than I was expecting it to be. It is still a commitment, but I just cannot wait to get off this train and continue this very much once in a lifetime road trip.
got an earphone in so that I can hear the instructions from Google Maps, which just took me on a bit of a weird route. So we got off the train in Calais, usually I joined the auto route, the motorway, straight away, but in advice I went through these kind of towns and villages, it was all quite slow speed, where this car's it's not that happy. But it is a race car, you drop below sort of 2,000 RPM, it starts bunny hopping around, and it's like, oh, 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 oh. You see race cars do that in the pit lane when they're at low speeds. It's like, oh, oh. it's not a nice feeling. It's much more its natural habitat, I think. Uh, I'm not taking the quickest route to Frankfurt today, mainly because I want to eke out this opportunity for as long as possible, uh, but also because the quickest route is through Belgium. And I hate driving through Belgium at the best of times, let alone in a Diablo SVR. So going south through France is going to add an hour, an hour and a half to my journey time but the auto routes, the motorway, they're beautifully smooth, they're open, they're clear. I know them fairly well. I think I also know a few places where we can get off it and hopefully find some good roads to drive. A few other places where we can stop off and do some other things. So anyway, this is the route I'm going. Uh, and for now, I'm going to get my head down, get some vials under my belt. And I guess I'm going to be stopping next in a couple of hours, probably for fuel, just to stretch my legs. Well, that got interesting. The fuel gauge got to half a tank and then plummeted to empty. I don't think I suddenly lost all my fuel. I feel like it's a unique characteristic of Italian electronics from the 90s. Uh, anyway, I've pulled in yeah, here and I'm filling up now. This car actually has a 100 litre fuel tank. So no matter what MPG I'm doing, it's gonna take me relatively far between fuel stops. I've got, well, I've put 63 litres in so far. You have to be so careful because this has got the race fuel filler system. Um, there's nothing to stop the sort of fuel, you know, flying back. So you have to squeeze so gently on the petrol pump, otherwise it keeps clicking. So yeah, easy does it. Um, this next leg, I'll monitor my sort of MPG a lot closer. Um, it'll be easier to work out what I'm doing, but quite hard to fill up. It's also a really awkward angle, and then how much I'm leaning down. It's not that much fun. See, it's clicking out at around 65 or 66 liters, which is actually exactly what happened yesterday when I filled it up before I left and it was indicating half tank. So I think there's still a good 30 or, well, 40 liters left in the tank when it's reading empty, which is good to know. Okay. Let's see, we should have a full tank. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, when it reads empty, I now know I've got around 30 litres left. As this is a Lamborghini race car, I should probably bring it to some kind of race track, even if it's an old abandoned one. Uh, welcome back to Rams. I've been here many times over the years, but not for a while. I think this place was last used in like the 1950s for Formula One races, um, but you can still come and visit it. I think there's a museum and a way you can kind of donate so that it's kept in this way. And if you're ever in the area, I highly recommend it. It is so emotive. You can kind of feel the old atmosphere. Somehow it's still within these pit and paddock buildings and the SVR looks sensational here. A couple of local photographers spied me coming through town and have come to take some photos and I don't blame them. I've already taken a thousand photos, I'm going to take a thousand more. I have to admit, I've always loved the way that the Diablo has looked. I mean, traditionally, I prefer cars from the late 90s, early noughties. That's kind of my era, which is way more Mercy Largo. But Diablo has always kind of spoken to me a bit more. I think it's the wedge shape, the old classic lines. These days they're becoming really popular, but everyone's going mad for the later VT and GTR. But for me, they're just a bit too, I don't know, I just, the SV and the SVR are the ones for me. 
have to admit, I don't remember this road being as busy as it is today, but it doesn't really matter. So just to stare at that thing, even in the rain, it looks even cooler in the rain. So yeah, I'll waste a bit more time here and then we'll crack on. Well, you find me a slightly unimpressive 392 kilometers down the road from my last fuel stop. I've just filled up again, put in about 67 liters, which means that if my math is correct, we're doing, I think, about 16.4 mpg. Not great, but I mean, it is a hunking great old V12. So what was I expecting? Anyway, I'm now in Germany, still about an hour and a half, maybe two hours from Frankfurt, I can see just outside the petrol station is an unrestricted section of Autobahn. Now, I think I'd be quite brave to attempt like a top speed run <laughs> in this car, but I think I can at least try and stretch its legs, right? I mean, it is a race car. It's got racing brakes. The fact I can't really see the speedo is a little concerning, but I think if I'm careful, I've got to give it a go, right? I mean, when in Rome, and a little bit further down the road, if the rain stays off, which it's not doing right now, uh, I'm going to try and turn off the autobahn and find some nice back roads. Let's see. Anyway, the adventure doth continue. Wish me luck, people. This could be an absolute death sentence. Autobahn was a little too busy and a little too wet to do any proper high speed running, so I've turned off it. And I'm on some kind of back roads, I guess, like a hundred kilometers southwest of Frankfurt. I've never been here before, but they looked inviting, and it is still very wet. And I don't know what's ahead of me, but I'm gonna try and stretch the legs of this car a little bit because oh, it's been fantastic today, honestly. What a good cruiser the Diablo SVR is, but obviously, it's not really what it was designed for, so. I want to throw it at some corners and see what happens. I mentioned the, uh, the VT earlier. Some of you might remember that I drove the VT in a standard SVR back to back last year. I ended up preferring the standard SV well, for a number of reasons. And obviously this thing, whilst it is the SVR, in road legal spec, it's probably quite similar to a standard SV. But actually it's not. It's got way more of an edge to it. I think this is what I expected the standard SV to be like. It has got that kind of stripped out feeling to it. It's got that aggression, feels pent up. The standard SV was kind of lovely as a road car. Just poodled around in it. This thing, oh, here we go. It's so funny because Lamborghini have kept their DNA throughout the years. For every generation, they're poster cars. But this thing is so different to drive to a modern day Lambo, take example of events, or even a Murcielago. The VT is much closer to modern day Lambos, which is I think well, maybe why so many people are liking them. Feels familiar. This feels like Lambo of old. I gotta be honest, you have to be a, a hairy chested gentleman or a broad shouldered lady to really feel like you're at one with this car. It is a bit of an animal, <laughs> which I adore, but I, I don't, you know, I don't feel like I'm on top of it. It's funny because it must weigh only about 1400 kilos, this thing, but it doesn't feel light. The steering is heavy, the clutch pedal is heavy. It kind of feels like you're lugging the V12 around with you. And when you get to a straight, the engine rewards you for carrying it with you. Because yeah, that power is just, oh! <laughs> it's not that kind of symphonic V12 that we've become used to from Lambo in recent years. It's got a real, well, they go bullish character. Also, you can probably see now what I was talking about with the fogging up windscreen. It has made driving today a little bit dangerous at times, but this 
might be my only chance to do stuff like this, so I'm not going to hold back. What a thing this is! To think that people drove this flat out on a racetrack, it is extraordinary. They would have had a major corners. My lord, I think Tiffany Dell raced these back in the day, and that makes sense because he is a lunatic. The brakes, actually, the brakes are pretty good. I was about to say they feel like they're from the 90s, they do. It's kind of like not a lot going on in the pedal, but they, they work. Positioning the car on the road is interesting because it's such a wedge. And the steering is precise. I mean, look at me. I've, I've literally never been on this road before in my life. And this car gives me so much confidence. Don't get me wrong, though. This thing will bite if I wanted it to. Got to remember, this is not my car. It's not a factory press car that can easily be put back together if I get it all wrong. I still have like an hour and a half to go till I get back to the Colossophy, so yeah, let's let's wind things down so maybe I'll stop, take some photos, then go back up and down that road a few times. <laughs> I so nearly put this drive off because of the weather. I'm so glad I didn't.
Well, can you believe it? Some, I think 960 kilometers later, 15 hours on the road, I've made it to Frankfurt with the Diablo SVR. My knees are a little sore from those heavy pedals. My ears are ringing a bit from how noisy the cabin was, but all in all, what a relatively easy journey. I mean, I had literally the worst of the weather. This thing was fine. I mean, you know, we should all be dailying Diablo SVRs. An amazing opportunity. Let's head inside and find the guys. Let's head inside and find the guys and yeah, decompress from this epic journey. Well, this place is outrageous. Let me come and introduce you to Moritz and Alex who are looking over a car we're about to check out. Guys, I want to show everyone these two because we've just been talking. This, we've got an SE30 and a Yota Diablo. I actually knew nothing about this car until about 10 minutes ago. And you've now blown my mind. It. Yeah, we've basically already come up with the second road trip that we're going to be doing, which is driving this back to the UK. Uh, they don't seem convinced yet, but I think by the end of the video, we'll be able to get them on board. Um, but you said we have to start this thing. Yes, come okay. over, yeah. we'll shortly show you what is the difference and then we can start it up. So just explain, because you've been telling me off camera, but explain to people what makes this and I guess the SE30 so special. just film the engine, you can see immediately that you have the air intakes on the top and from, on this one, the air intakes come from the side. The air comes here from the side, okay. you know, inside here, whereby on the Yota, the air comes in into these, into these scoops directly down there. Yes, and the camshafts, exhaust, ECUs are different and it's way more aggressive. You have more air pressure and it brings about, let's say 70 to 80 horsepower as well. Okay. And way at more least. torque, at least 70 to 80, and way more torque and let, let's fire it up. You will hear it immediately. Okay, I, do I want to be standing? <laughs> do I want to be standing this close and to the That's a beast. Driving wise, it's a beast. You know, mm. and, this, and the engine character explodes in, I would say, three different levels. Wow. It's amazing. <laughs> Wait a uh, second. <laughs> it's cold. <laughs> yeah, that is. So it's basically made for uh, race use. The Yota kit was made. directly hear the different the different cams you have on the car that what do you makes think? It I, I have to drive this one guys you gave me the wrong car no 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 that is that is basically the start you you made you made the the, the boot camp if you want to call it like that. <laughs> I passed yeah. the test well, essentially I would say you are, you are prepared to drive a real crazy car this came before the S yeah that is basically yes. before the so the SV was presented 95 yeah uh, and the Yota was presented uh, basically in end of 94 was okay. the kit presented yes. Yes. Yeah, because basic 95 SC30 first 93 for exactly. 30 years of Lamborghini. Yeah. Wow. And 95 first cars were delivered like this one. For how example. many? How many of these? Uh, like we we 20. are aware of how many real cars. That's the, that's the point. Because that is the point. many of these cars or some of them went to Japan and some <clears> people <throat> took off the camshafts and the kit because it was too aggressive to drive it. Uh. So the number is around 30 of the cars you can count, but um, as our dad was in the past by then already into these, these cars and he said it was under 20 cars which were produced or let's say that the kit was put on the cars by the factory. Wow. It was so the some cars 17 were done back in the days. Yes. Yeah. Like that, like that. Wow. Oh yeah, this thing is... <laughs> I mean, I really enjoyed my experience today. Just, and just to give you an indication, as a Ferrari guy, if this is an F40, what, you know, we are all fans of John Tamerian, and he always says the SE30 is basically Lamborghini's F40, maybe there's something true on it. Okay. This would be an F40 LM. Just to compare it, how crazy that is. In yeah. And let, just let, let, look at the interior, because it's dark purple. I mean, that is stunning. And carbon fiber, lots of carbon fiber on this thing yeah. as well. Also um, the dashboard by itself. It's carbon fiber. I didn't know that before, but we yeah. refreshed that. And it's carbon fiber? It's carbon fiber. Wow. It's very 
Unbelievable. Carbon cool. fiber. Carbon fiber. <laughs> Someone's been watching a lot of Some TikTok. Some kind of an yeah. exotic word, yeah. especially <laughs> back in the day. So wow. just to say that, front bumper carbon fiber, uh, front hood, back hood, uh, back bumper rockers, all carbon fiber, wing is carbon fiber, mm. the, uh, the dash is carbon whole fiber, the, the whole oh, interior wow. seats, middle tunnel, uh, yeah, the, the door panels, well, everything Tino is carbon fiber. to us 180 kilo less than the first gen, than the first where gen. they started to. Yeah. So wow. basically, yeah, first wow. generation. Okay, so look, I feel like we could talk Diablos <laughs> all day. I thought I was going to be like, let's be on. Now I'm all about these guys. I'm going to force you both to pick one if you had to drive away. Because I just thought I drove the best iteration, but now I've found out I haven't. So quickly, you're going Yota, Alex? The SVR. SVR, yes. You know, you know where it's at, don't you? <laughs> guys, thank you so much. This has been an amazing opportunity. Well, if you ever need a delivery driver again, you, you know who to you know who to call. Yeah? I guess we figure already an idea of yeah. what kind of logistics you're doing yeah. in the next for us. Yeah. Perfect, we'll amazing. Thank you, guys. I'll see you again very soon. Okay. Bye bye. I have long said cars are there to be driven. I used to say it again and again when doing adventures in my 360 Modena. As long as your car is regularly maintained and regularly used, there's no reason why it can't go on big adventures with you. And the memories one makes in these more analog cars that require more attention, require you to be involved, require you and the car to be a team to make it to the destination, go way beyond those you can make in a modern car that does 90% of the job for you. Apart from the heavy pedals and the cockpit noise, I was shocked at how easy this drive was. I was amazed at how good the car was on the wet back roads. Now, a few things you should know. The car has an additional extractor fan fitted. You may have seen me flick the switch in the Euro tunnel. That's just to aid cooling, as these things like to get hot, especially race cars which are used to running at high speed around a circuit all day. The car also has a kill switch, as battery life can be a bit interesting. I took a fire extinguisher with me and the bolt for the central lock wheels, along with a torque wrench, because if I had a puncture, chances of a random tire shop in the middle of, I don't know what, France or Germany having the right size wrench for a 1990s Lamborghini race car were slim. So what I'm saying is preparations were made, but fail to prepare, prepare to fail. I will remember this trip for a long time, and it's another Lambo experience that I have loved. Huge thanks to Alex and Moritz for being proper car people, proper drivers, and facilitating this. Now, Diablo owners, go and drive your cars. And for the rest of us, time to work a bit harder, save up some money, and go buy our dreams. Yeah.